Welcome everybody on behalf of my colleagues at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, which is also known as SIMS. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's lecture, the final one in this fall series. My name is Lynn Ransom and I'm the Curator of Programs at SIMS. And today we'll be hearing from Professor Tara Andrews from the University of Vienna. Professor Andrews will be introduced momentarily by my colleague, Doc Porter, who is Curator of Digital Research Services at SIMS and the Kislak Center for Special Collections Rare Books and Manuscripts at Penn Libraries. But before we begin today's program, I'd like to say a few words about our institute and alert you to some of our upcoming events. The mission of SIMS is to bring manuscript culture, modern technology, and people together to bring access to an understanding of our shared intellectual heritage. We like to think of ourselves as both a think tank of sorts and a resource for the study of pre-modern manuscripts in the digital age. To that end, we aim to make our resources, programs, and data available to scholars and students around the world. We invite users at all levels to contribute, to use and, and contribute to projects such as the Schoenberg Database of Manuscripts or VizCall, an online collation tool, or to freely, <clears throat> freely use manuscript data available and open, our fully open access repository, <coughs> excuse me, of metadata and images. You can find out more about these and other projects by visiting our website at www.schoenberginstitute.org. In addition to making data available to the world, we also seek to bring scholars to Penn to study our manuscripts through a series of programs, including a visiting research fellowship that brings up to three scholars a year to campus for a month, to research our manuscript and digital collections. We will be opening a call for that program in March and more information regarding the program and past fellows can be found on our website. We also host the annual Schoenberg Symposium on Manuscript Studies in the Digital Age, now in its 15th year. The symposium brings together scholars at all levels to present research on a specific topic. We are in the early stages of planning next year's symposium, which will be on the topic translating science. This will consider the methods, forms, and results of translation across scientific traditions, languages, geographies, disciplines, and practices. While the exact date has not yet been set, it will take place next fall, and we'll be announcing the details later this spring. In addition to these programs, we also publish a biannual journal called Manuscript Studies, which aims to embrace the full complexity of global manuscript studies through both traditional and digital scholarship. We are actively seeking submissions for the spring of 2023 and beyond. And if you're interested in submitting, please feel free to contact us at any time. We're also delighted to be able to host events such as today's lecture and to be able to do this virtually to include people who wouldn't otherwise be able to come to our lecture on, uh, to a lecture on our campus. We will be resuming the online series in February and we'll announce the program for next spring in early January. And finally, if you're interested in following SIMS events and programs, please consider signing up for our newsletter. We will be posting a link to that in the chat as well as links to our website and journal for more information. So before handing the screen over to Dot Porter, I do have a few housekeeping items to share. First, as you may notice, we will be recording the presentation and we'll be posting the video to the Schoenberg Institute's YouTube channel sometime after the new year. We will announce this on Twitter and Facebook, so please do follow us and share widely once it's up. My colleagues and I will be monitoring the chat. Uh, my colleague Nick Herman, especially, who uh, does not have a screen on, uh, but he'll, he'll be monitoring the chat. And if you have any questions along the way, please go ahead and type them in at and at the end of the lecture, we'll pass those questions along to our speaker. There's Nick. Nick is the Lawrence J. Schoenberg Curator of Manuscripts at SIMS. So without further ado, Dot, I hand the screen over to you and thank you all very much for being here. Thank you, Lynn. So um, when you've known someone for a while, it can be hard to remember the first time you met. And that's how I feel about today's speaker, Tara Andrews, University Professor of Digital Humanities at the Institute for Geschichte at the University, University of Vienna. 
It feels as though I have always known her, always been aware of her work, but my most distinct memory of Professor Andrews is talking with her after a conference. I think that it was the Digital Scholarly Editions as Interfaces Conference at the University of Graz back in 2016, which is over five years ago, although I don't think that it possibly could have been the first time that our paths crossed. In any case, what I remember of that evening was a thoughtful conversation with someone who not only had a deep understanding of the theory and practice of the scholarly editing of manuscripts, manuscript texts, but also had an intense and thorough knowledge of computational methods, and who had thought a lot about how those methods might be practically brought to bear on complex medieval texts. This isn't surprising given Professor Andrew's background. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Humanities and Engineering from MIT, an MPhil in Byzantine Studies, and a DPhil in Oriental Studies, both from the University of Oxford. I was impressed to see that her DPhil thesis includes a discussion of computer-assisted methods used to edit the text, which was a critical edition of the Chronicle of Matthew of Edessa, which she'll be speaking about today. Professor Andrews' fields of expertise include the history and historiography of the Christian Near East in the 10th to the 12th centuries, the application of computational and statistical methods for reconstruction of the copying history of ancient and medieval manuscripts, and importantly, reflection on the implication of employing digital media and computational methods in humanities contexts. Her current research interests revolve around the dynamic modeling of textual variation, the application of artificial intelligence methods to different domains such as medieval history or Armenian paleography, and more theoretical questions about the ways in which humanities researchers understand their use, or avoidance in some cases, of digital tools for their work. In other words, she touches on so many things that are of interest to those of us who work in the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies and which we are thrilled to bring to you today. Since early 2018, Professor Andrews has been serving as a research director of the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities at the Austrian Academy of Sciences, with a special focus on the areas of machine learning, archeological and heritage data, digital editions, legal issues, knowledge transfer in society, and server administration. We are very pleased that Professor Andrews is with us today, and she will be speaking with us on the rescue of Armenian historiography and the Chronicle of Matthew of Edessa. Without further ado, Dr. Andrews. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I'm pretty sure we go back as far as 2010 or 2011, certainly well before I had such an exalted title of professor. So, so thank you very much to Lynn for the invitation and to Dot for the, for the very kind introduction. And um, as, as Dot has suggested, a lot of people know me best for my digital work, but I always feel a little bit um, guilty when I'm, when I'm confronting manuscript studies people with all of my digital work because I have this usual sort of digital edition habit of ripping the text from the manuscripts and leaving the manuscripts discarded on the floor while I go on and, and do more modeling with the text itself. So for this, for this talk, I thought that um, I would take the opportunity to come back to the manuscripts. And so this isn't going to be a very digital talk, but I want to talk about the, some of the fascinating little puzzles that I've encountered in trying to understand the history of this text in the manuscripts uh, in its manuscripts, this text that I primarily work on. So this is basically an outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'll tell you, first of all, what the Chronicle of Matthew of Edessa is, then say something about the Armenian colophon tradition, and then go on to the, um, the puzzles that I want to talk about in this, in this transmission history. And finally, I'll give you a little taste at the end about the digital edition that we're working on um, at the end. So the Chronicle of Matthew of Edessa, it's a source that is a historical source that crusade historians will certainly have heard of. Um, Matthew was a monastic priest. He lived in Edessa. He's, he's the, the only way we know of him is by his name, Mateus Orhayetzi, which means Matthew of Orha or Edessa. He was an eyewitness to the events of the First Crusade and he wrote this chronicle starting not long after the First Crusade had happened. So he started the writing the Chronicle sometime around 1102. He finished writing what he wrote sometime around 1131. And he covers events all the way back from the mid 10th century down to the year 1129. 
Now, his text, after a gap of a few years, was continued by another priest called Grigor from a nearby town of Kasun. So Grigor wasn't from Edessa, but he was from not far away. And Grigor took the text down to 1162. And the other interesting thing about the Chronicle of Matthew is that it was adopted by Sambat, who was the, the brother of the king of Cilician Armenia in the 13th century. Um, Sambat basically paraphrased Matthew of Edessa's text for the first half of his own chronicle, and then continued with information with things that had happened after the mid 11th century, sorry, the mid 12th century. The geographical range of the chronicle is quite broad. It covers Edessa and Syria. It covers Ar Armenia as in the, the um, land in the Caucasus. It covers Byzantium. It covers Georgia. It covers, um, and it goes beyond. You get you get information about wars in Bulgaria, you get occasional events about you know, occasional mentions of things in Egypt and Baghdad and Isfahan and so on. So Matthew talks about quite a lot of things, although most of his attention is focused on the experience of the Armenians who made up his community. Now the Chronicle itself, it survives in at least 35 manuscripts. And the interesting thing about the Menu about the transmission of this particular text is that the surviving manuscripts are all quite late. Matthew was writing, as we say, sometime in the early 12th century between roughly 1102 and 1131. We have one fragment of text from 1582. That's the earliest fragment we have. It's only one piece of one entry, essentially. The first full copy of the text was written sometime between 1590 and 1600. And the second full copy that we have was written in 1601. And then by 100 years later, we have 21 copies. Um, and then, so after that, you know, 14 more copies in the 18th and 19th centuries. So actually, the great majority of the copies that we have of this text all come from the 17th century, no earlier, no later. And so because of this, the stemma has been quite hard to construct. I did make a stab at it in my, in my uh, defil thesis. I constructed a stemma of most of the 17th century manuscripts that I could get my hands on. But the trouble with the chronicle text is that, you know, it's something that will be, I think, familiar to people who work on medieval texts and especially prose or more or less vernacular texts is that you can't really say very, you know, you can't really say very much about um, what kind of grammar Matthew was using and versus what kind of grammar the copies are using because all of the copies are from the 17th century. It's a relatively stable text. You have little tiny bits of variation, but it's not really easy to tell. You know, there, there's not really any good indication that oh, this is a 12th century construction versus this is a 17th century construction. You very occasionally come to um, you get, get um, situations where you can do this, but it's not nearly enough to actually make a stemma. So this is, you know, from the, from the text genealogical point of view, this can be very hard, but in Armenian studies, we have a secret weapon. And this is the colophons. The Armenian tradition, and it's the habit of scribes of leaving colophons in their texts, makes us the absolute envy of our Greek and Latin philological peers. What do these colophons have? They're, they're present in about half of the manuscripts we have. They're not always there, but they're often there, and you can almost say they're usually there. And the thing about the colophons is that they're, the word for them in Armenian is hishatakaran, which literally means place of memory or place of remembrance. So, and this is exactly what they were used for. They were places where the scribe, you know, and usually this is exactly what the message was. The scribe would say, you know, remember to God my, you know, the sinful scribe, Yaakov, and my parents, and maybe give the parents names, um, maybe give the, the name of the sponsor if the manuscript is sponsored, maybe give the, uh, you know, certainly usually give the place or the date of copying. Um, you might even have mention of contemporaneous events, or even we have some colophons that are actually short chronicles in their own right. Um, here in the picture, I have a colophon which was written in 1236, 
that was describing the Mongol Sakha Ani, which was happening essentially as this manuscript was being copied. And so these colophones are an amazing source of information about who was writing the manuscript, when they were writing it, where they were, and sometimes, you know, what was going, around, going on around them. And as we will see, even occasionally, sometimes information about which manuscript they were copying, which is really, really nice when you're trying to make a stem. So from the colophons we have, we can see that during the 17th century alone, this chronicle actually got all over the place. Um, this map shows the 12 manuscripts written by 1700 for which the colophon tells us where it was copied. So we had what, 21 by 1700. And so more than half of them, we have a place mentioned in the, in the manuscript. And you can see that in these 100 years, it was copied all the way from Italy to um, what was then um, what was then Poland to you know to Constantinople to the Caucasus all the way down to Isfahan in Iran, it was everywhere. And this is this sounds like it might be a really sort of interesting and unusual pattern, and it's certainly interesting. But for Armenian studies, it's actually not unusual. This pattern where the text barely exists, there are no copies or very few copies until the 17th century and then suddenly copies are everywhere. That's actually part of a broader, a broader phenomenon. And it often leads us to talk, to talk about something called the rescue of Armenian literature. Because the vast majority of the extant Armenian manuscripts for pretty much any text come exactly from the 17th century. And this is no accident. Now, why is this? Well, the 15th and the 16th centuries were pretty disastrous ones as far as the security of Armenian life and culture and community were concerned. After the conquest by Tamerlane in, in the uh, let's see, early 15th century, um, after Tamerlane was gone, then there were rivalries between various Turkic tribes, such as the Karakoyunlu and the Akkoyunlu. And then with the rise of Safavid Persia and their rivalry with Ottoman Turkey, by the mid 15th century, um, the Armenian, you know, the sort of cultural Armenian lands were being a battleground between Safavid Iran or Safavid Persia and Ottoman Turkey. And this spelled disaster for the Armenian prosperity, the Armenian communities, the Armenian monuments that were there. And it also included forced migration of communities during this time. And in fact, not only the copying of texts, but Armenian literary production at all slows to a crawl during this period. We have very, very little that survived, you know, that was written originally between the mid, you know, in the in the 15th, from the mid 15th to about the end of the 16th century. In historiography, um, Armenian historiography has this chain of works that covers most of the time from the, from the Christianization of Armenia in the early fourth century. But as far as historiography is current concerned, we have the history of Tovla Metsopetsi, which was written in the 1440s, which discussed the incursions of Tamerlane. And then the next history we have comes from 1669, which is the history of Arakel of Tabriz. And between those 200 years, nobody was writing history in Armenian that, that we know about. But in the 17th century, peace began to return to Armenian territories. The, the rivalry between Persia and Turkey didn't entirely go away, but the 17th century found some calm and some, some chance for the Armenian communities to regenerate and, and begin, to, um, begin to be able to have their culture again. And, of course, and also by this time, there were major communities of Armenians established in Eastern Europe, in the Crimea, as well as elsewhere within the Ottoman and the Safavid realms, such as Constantinople, such as Lebanon, such as Isfahan, such as um, Nujulfa, which was the, the big um, displaced community that, that, that was near Isfahan. And we see a lot of copying activity starting from here. And one particular center of note was a monastery, which was in Bitlis, which um, is not marked as such on the map, but if you see the green pin with an A next to it, that is, that is a manuscript that was written in Bitlis that we're going to be talking about. 
Um, this monastery was known as the Amadolu Monastery, and between 1662 and 1704, the abbot, the abbot of that monastery was one Vardan Bagashetsi, which is to say Vardan of Bitlis, and he oversaw a program of copying of historiographical texts in particular, but also other texts. And it is due to the initiative of Vardan Bagashetsi that the, his, his initiative is the only reason that we have any copy at all of seven major works of Armenian historiography. Um, and these major works of Armenian historiography are the ones that tell us about the Christianization of Armenia, about the invention of the Armenian alphabet, about the fifth century in Armenia, about the seventh century in Armenia, about the 10th century in Armenia, and so on and so forth. If these manuscripts had not, had not been copied in Bitlis under the aegis of Vardan Bayashetsi, then Armenian history would be as lost to us as say the history of Caucasian Albania is today. Um, so Vardan also paid attention to the chronicle of Matthew of Edessa. There was a copy, this, this copy labeled A there made in 1689. And we're gonna be hearing a little bit more about that copy in this talk. And while the Chronicle of Matthew, as we can see from this map, it had its survival assured without Vardan's intervention. The copy that was made here in Bitlis had some very important features and it shares a manuscript with a copy of this important 10th century text that is the reason we know anything about the late 9th and early 10th centuries in Armenia. So against this background, I'd like to go into a little more detail about the history of the Chronicle and the copies that were made. Starting with how many versions were there? Um, yeah, because we have a long version, well, we have a few long versions actually, and we have a short version. And the interesting thing here is that Matthew's Chronicle is divided into three books and he has put his own, I guess you can call it a colophon at the beginning of book two and at the beginning of book three. And the one at the beginning of book two says that he is, um, you know, so that says that he's been working on this text for eight years and then he's going to go on with his history. And book two ends in about 1102, which is around the time that he was, he seems to have been starting to write the book. And then book three begins with another longer colophon, which says that he put the history away for a time and he wasn't going to write anymore. But then 20 years, 15 years passed and he saw that no one was picking up picking up his work and no one was writing history. And so he decided he would return to the task after all, even though he didn't think he was the best person to do it. And so then we had, you know, almost mirroring this, this pause that Matthew seems to have taken in writing the, the Chronicle, we have this group which is, which carries the text not quite to the end of book two, but nearly to the end of book two. So through the year 1097, instead of through the year 1102. Then the rest of the texts are longer. There is a group that has the text only through the year 1111. Um, and there's no really obvious reason why it should have ended in 1111 besides the part of the text having been lost. And then the other remaining manuscripts carry the text through to the end of Grigor's continuation. If we remember, Grigor wrote a continuation starting about 1136 and going to 1163. So, the question arose quite early in my head, well, maybe, maybe this represents different authorial receptions. Maybe the text that I'm calling group A or the Vienna group, maybe they're a version of the text that was Matthew's first version of the text. And then the rest of them come from a version of the text that Matthew, you know, since he picked it up again later, maybe, maybe he rewrote, rewrote it somehow. And maybe there are two recensions circulating. Maybe, but there are some, puzzling things arguing against this. Um, and I should say also that we have a particularly intriguing manuscript. Um, this is manuscript much matter on 3519. And this bit here, although it's not obvious, it's not set apart in the text, this bit here is actually a colophon. And what it's doing is that it's warning the reader that actually the, the exemplar that it has stopped here. And so, you know, please reader understand that um, that we can't take the text any further um, sinful though we are, it's not actually our fault because the, the exemplar st stops here. And then you turn the page and the text just carries on. So 
this is quite nice from a stomatological point of view because there are a lot of analytical and computational and philological methods for trying to figure out when an exemplar change has happened in a manuscript. So imagine this Armenian situation where it just tells you, isn't that nice for once? But you can see that um, you can see that the the scribes were, you know, they, they don't do things by accident. So this scribe left this note to make it clear that that text had ended, but then went on with another text from another exemplar that the scribe had found. And it gets even more interesting in terms of the scribes knowing the features of the text that knowing the, the features of the text, even if those features weren't reflected in their exemplar. Here's another example, and this is probably the biggest argument against the idea of these two groups representing two authorial recensions, which is that there is a pair of gaps across the entire tradition, which our copyist in Bitlis actually did some work on, as we will see. This is an example of another manuscript, Machinara in 1767, and you can see that these blank columns are left in order to allow the later edition of the missing text, meaning that the scribe knew that the text was missing and knew how much space to leave for it, even though it was never filled in later. So let's look at these gaps. There are two substantial passages of text missing from all but Matanara in 1896, which is our bitless manuscript. The first one of these comes for the years 1017 to 1020. There's an Apocryphal, an apocryphal tale of Basil II, the, the emperor of Byzantium, sneaking off near the end of his life and secret, secretly getting baptized according to the Armenian rite and therefore being adopted as you know, father, of the, father of the Armenians, essentially. And the bit that's missing also misses out the, a good chunk of one of the two major prophecies that are a feature of book one of the Chronicle, these two prophecies of Hofanes Kozern. And the text is missing from every single manuscript except for Matanara on 1896. There's a slightly different situation with the second missing package, passage of text because it's not just gone from most of the manuscripts, it's more like it's abridged. And so there's, a, there's an episode with a Turkish emir Katrich coming and making an attack and then the, and then in the, in the beginning of the following year, there's an eclipse that happens but in most of the manuscripts, this coming of Katrich and the eclipse are sort of merged into one passage that leaves out the eclipse and leaves out a lot of details about this, this incursion of Katrich. And again, the only place that we have a different version is in, so, and again, in, in both of these cases, the absence is known to several scribes. There will be, sometimes there will be space left. Other times there will just be a little note saying, you know, there's text missing here but not, not any space left because the scribe doesn't think that they're going to find the text. But a closer look tells us something interesting. The text was also originally missing in the Matanara in 1896, and it was literally pasted in. So imagine my surprise when I was going through this, this um, you know, these, these manuscript images and saw that actually someone had taken a, a, a literal piece of paper and written new text and pasted it over the top. And you can tell, you can see around the margins. Um, I don't know if I get my mouse, I don't think I get my mouse pointer here. But if you look around the margins of that pasted in patch, you can see that there's text underneath. And even if you don't read Armenian, if you look at the handwriting above the patch and the handwriting on the patch, you can probably tell that it's different handwriting. So someone has, someone has come along and actually changed, changed the text here. And I haven't taken any steps toward using any kind of imaging to find out what is underneath the patch because I'm pretty sure I can tell you without looking what's underneath the patch. What's underneath the patch is almost certainly the beginning of the abridged passage as it is in the other manuscripts. I'd be, I'd be astonished if it was anything else. But what makes this even more mysterious as an intervention in the text is that there's this one little patch, but then the text as it continues here is much longer than this little passage here. The hand on the patch, the hand, so the, the manuscript handwriting that is on the patch takes up also the next four columns, but not patched over, simply it's, it's in that second handwriting. And then the hand above the patch resumes from the fifth column, 
fifth column onwards somewhat seamlessly. But those four columns don't represent the entirety of the difference between Machinara in 1896 and the other manuscripts. Actually, they start agreeing somewhere in the middle of column four. And then the, the old hand, you know, the first hand takes over from column five, even though the text has already started agreeing with the previous exemplars. It's very mysterious. And it also suggests quite an amazing amount of planning and prior research that must have gone into preparing to make this copy even before the copy was made. In the other case, for the first gap, there isn't a patch, but it looks here precisely, if you remember in the, the previous image, I showed you a different manuscript where lots of columns had been left blank. Well, it's looking an awful lot like in this Machinata on 1896, the columns were left blank and then they were filled in just like the, the scribe of Machinara in 1731 had meant to do, um, 1896 actually did. And we can even see down at the bottom right where there's this erased text. And essentially that's, that translates from Armenian as at this place, a great deal of text is missing. And so then when the text wasn't missing anymore, they were able to erase that little note at the bottom of the line. There you are. So the existence of these gaps and the fact that they exist in every version group and they were known as gaps to quite a few of the scribes and even their actual length was known to a few of the scribes. This makes it much harder to argue that we're seeing different authorial recensions here. If both recensions had the same gaps but those gaps were circulating somewhere in the traditions so that um, so that the bitless manuscript could have them filled in later, that makes it a much more complicated picture than I would expect in terms of this being a neat case of here's the first recension and here's the second recension. And the fact that the scribes were, you know, so many of the scribes were aware of the deficiencies of the text that they were copying, were aware that there's text missing here, were aware that the text missing here is text that I should leave precisely nine columns for its, uh, you know, for its filling in later. It gives the impression that there was a, actually a lot of textual research going on before even the before the pen was even set to to doing the copying um, to start with to to measure out the amount of text to met to find what was missing and to leave space for what was missing to plan. Um, how it was going to be filled in. And it's really, really quite fascinating that they were able to do this over such huge geographical distances as we appear to be talking about for these copies. If you, if you remember the, um, the map I showed you, these copies are all over the place by the end of the 17th century and they are being, they, they have these relations so that this information is circulating throughout these different groups of diaspora and um, and, you know, Cauc Caucasian Armenians doing the copying. So with that, I'd like to turn to the next little intrigue. I, I won't call it a mystery. It's more of an intrigue, which is say the role of Lviv in the copying because another, another little intrigue arises from the city. First of all, that we have this wonderful situation where we have one scribe who made two copies of the, manu of, of the chronicle in the same year, one from the long version and one from the short version. They're both copied in 1617. They're both identified in colophons as Zatik son of Colton. There's the, the bit with the colophon. And we don't know much about this guy because he doesn't leave, he doesn't ever leave any particularly long or explanatory colophons. He, he only identifies himself and then, um, sorry, he identifies himself and then he, he goes on to, he, he says he's the son of Colton that he says somewhere in one of them that he's in Lviv. He says at some point that it's the year 1617, but we don't really know anything else about him except that he did copy in the same year, both versions. So both versions had made it to Lviv. And he copied them each, apparently without actually 
trying to reconcile them. So that's the interesting thing. He had both copies in the same year, but he didn't try to do any kind of editorial work on them. He just copied the one and he copied the other. And there's no hint in either one that he was thinking back to the other. In fact, you can't even tell which one he copied first. There's just, there's not really any way to tell from the, um, from the line. And the other interesting thing around this, if you, if you can't read Armenian, then, then you won't see it. You might, you might be able to see it. What you're looking for is the fact that here, the colophon text is set apart by these series of dots that are above the words. And in fact, I find it interesting how he wrote this colophon because in the middle of those bottom two lines, you see a longer word in the middle of the first line and a shorter word in the middle of the second line. Actually, that's all one word. It says uh, Constantinople, Constantinopolis. Um, and he's writing the colophon. Actually, he, he finished the page with the word Constantinopolis, which was the end of the sentence at the end of the paragraph. And he has that little flourish after the police to say this is the end of the end of the section and he's actually written the colophon in the space around this diagonal bit that he left so you know they these are they they really like to pack their colophons in the in the margins literally in the margins here um where they can and it's it's a it's a typical site of remembrance he's asking the reader to remember him Zatik son of Colton and if the if you the reader remember him then he says, God will remember you. And there's another interesting connection that may go back to Lviv as well, because at the near the second, or well, in the second half of the century, in 1669, another manuscript, no, actually, sorry, wrong, wrong manuscript. At the end of the century, 1699, another manuscript was copied which eventually ended up in the library of the Armenian monastery of Zomar in Lebanon. Now this one, Zomar 449, it doesn't have the colophon in the original hand, but the first text in the manuscript is a confession of faith attributed to the Archbishop Vardan Yunanian, Kunanian, who was a major figure in the Armenian Catholic community of Lviv around this time, around the end of the 17th century. Now, since there's no colophon and since there's no real evidence, we can't say whether Hunanian himself wrote this manuscript or whether he had it commissioned by someone or, or set, set a scribe to, to working on it. But we do know something about its later history, thanks to a colophon that got added later that you can see there at the bottom of the, of the left-hand image. And that colophon tells us that this manuscript came eventually to Livorno in Italy, where it served as the exemplar for another copy of the Chronicle which was made by, by a priest called Father Karapet Halachian. And Father Halachian was working on the script, the, the text, which is the one on the right, um, according to the, the information, the colophon information we have for Zomar 644 on the right, it was written between 1775 and 1805. He was apparently working on it here and there for 20 years, according to what it says in the, in the colophons. But you can see, Halachian's colophon in the later manuscript on the right. And it looks rather like the same guy who wrote this second note in the one on the left. And it certainly matches in terms of information. Um, and so the colophon in the second manuscript incidentally does remark that while his exemplar is beautifully written, he says it's a pretty defective text. And he copied it as it was anyway. But he did note that, you know, he did say, you know, this text is wrong in many places. And one of the things that he mentioned it being, you know, one of the things that he mentioned being wrong with it is that, uh, well, we have a pretty good idea which group, sorry, I messed that up, but it, he, he wasn't wrong that it's a pretty defective text. Um, we have a pretty good idea which group Zamar 449 belongs to but its scribe has liberally paraphrased the text in a way that just doesn't happen in the rest of the manuscript tradition. Changing word orders, changing, changing the way you say things, um, you know, paraphrasing here and there. But this is interesting because it means that even though Father Karapet Halachian copied the text that he had, he was aware that it was wrong. And so he must have known what he should have been expecting. So it's interesting that, you know, again, this is a case of a scribe knowing the defects of a text and copying it anyway, which is something that we see keep happening here. Now, 
The last puzzle I want to present here also has a little bit of a connection to Lviv because the longer manuscript that was copied by Zatik um, back in 1617 seems to have been an ancestor to a different copy made down in Isfahan in 1669, which is now held by the Mkhitaryas Monastery in Venice. And the text of these two manuscripts, relatively speaking, they have quite a bit of divergence and little bits of phrasing from most of the rest of the tradition. So you can imagine my surprise when I noticed that in at least one place, this Venice manuscript that was copied either directly or indirectly from this Lviv manuscript has an entire paragraph added that is word for word identical with a paragraph of our manuscript written in Bitlis 20 years later, which otherwise comes from a completely different branch of the tradition. And this becomes actually really difficult to explain in any good way. The scribes and the dates and places of copying of the two texts are known through the, thanks to the colophons. The, um, the Bitlis manuscript was written by Jacob the priest in 1689, and the Isfahan manuscript was written 20 years earlier um, by a priest called Sargis. And what's more, this text, these two passages of text that are there, they're simply wrong. They don't belong there. Um, this passage describes in an entry for the year 1146, it describes a four-way split in the Armenian church that actually belongs in its history and is described um, in the time around the year 1085. So it's, it's mentioning a four-way split in the, in the Armenian patriarchate and it's mentioning the names of the different bishops and none of those bishops belong to 1146. They all belong to 1085. And it's a very, now it's the sort of, the strange mistake that I could, that sort of fits in with some of the other things I see from the Venice manuscript, but it doesn't fit at all with the sort of thing that I see from the Bitlis manuscript. And it, these are the only two manuscripts that have this particular passage in them. And it's really a mystery why, you know, why this happened or how this happened. And in fact, sometimes I keep going back and forth, kind of comparing the handwriting and saying, you know, even though it says it's different scribes, were they like father and son? Were they brother? Who knows? And, um, and in any case, it suggests very strongly that the, um, the manuscript copied in Isfahan, the Venice 901, was used for whatever research or preparation was done in making the Bitlis copy. And so this, this erroneous passage got pulled into the Bitlis copy, even though it did, didn't get pulled in anywhere else. So I don't really have a good explanation for this mystery, but it's something that is there. And it's something that really says a lot about the different puzzles that are, prevented, that are presented by this manuscript tra transmission. And when you take all of these stories together, they say some pretty amazing things about the sheer geographical reach of manuscript circulation among Armenians in the 17th century throughout Eastern Europe and the, and the Near East. And so whatever else they were, we can say that these texts were extremely well-traveled. And I just want to end by pointing out something that is known to us in the field, but it always takes, it, it always bears reminding which is that 35 manuscripts though I have, it will only ever be a small, small sliver of the story because so much of the Armenian manuscript heritage has been destroyed. Not only in the medieval and early modern warfare of the 15th and 16th century that I was talking about earlier, but perhaps most spectacularly horribly during the genocide of 1915. It's depressing and it's exhausting to count up the communities, the churches, the monasteries, the libraries that were torched during that year with the explicit aim of wiping out not only the people, but the traces that they had ever existed. And it's of course, partly thanks to the well-established diaspora that we have as much as we do, but at the same time, we can't help but feel the overwhelming loss of the heritage, the colophones, these places of remembrance and the prayers for the souls of the scribes and scholars that went up in smoke that year and that we'll never get back. So finally, to conclude this talk, I'd like to touch on the digital work a little bit after all, and say a few words about the online edition of the Chronicle that's in preparation. It's been in preparation for quite a while, but we, we keep working at the pace that we can work. Um, this is a, a 
fun little screenshot of what it looks like. And um, it's a project that's been ongoing with the support of the Swiss National Science Foundation since 2015. Um, we're beyond the scope of the SNSF project, but we do keep on working on it. Um, there are full TEI XML transcriptions of all available manuscripts. We did these using TPEN and then a custom pipeline to, to transmute them from TPN to, from TPEN to TEI. Um, we have the, the graphical collation that you saw and we allow, we enable side-by-side -side witness comparison. So you can have the edited text and the translation, or you can have the edited text in any particular manuscript to compare side by side or any two particular manuscripts. We have English translations of all the texts that we publish, and we have the annotation of the persons, places, and the dates that are mentioned in the text. Now, this editorial work is still ongoing, and it will be ongoing for a while. In fact, I recently applied for a new project to um, expand the work on this, actually, and try to incorporate also this history of Simbat Sparapet. Uh, and the reason I want to do this is because, as you have seen, the Chronicle of Matthew Edessa, written though it was in the 12th century, only survives from the 17th century onward. But Simbat Sparapet, who was using the text in the 13th century, one of his manuscripts survives from the 14th. And so wouldn't it be fun? So in a way, Simbat, who was a witness to Matthew, or who was a witness to Matthew, might end up, you know, having, you know, being the closest thing we can get to an exemplar of Matthew. And so this raises some really fascinating editorial modeling questions that I'm, so I'm kind of dying to get my hands on in terms of, you know, how do you represent a text when it's not just one text, but a paraphrase in another text where the paraphrase is the earliest witness of the text. And, you know, where, where, did, where are even boundaries of text? And how do you put that in the computer? So this is what I'm hoping to do in the next few years. But in the meantime, you're welcome to um, you're welcome to stop by the web page. I've put the URL to the edition as it is there. There's not a great deal of text published there, but you can see you can see how we are how we are presenting the text that we're publishing and the the editorial work that we've done. We're still working on the stemma, but um, we've promised to paper with the stemma by the end of next June. So so we'll have a stemma soon, despite all of these challenges. And um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Uh, thank you very much for that really interesting talk. And it is, I was, um, it's just shocking that so much material uh, has been lost. Um, and I, I really admire what you're, what you're doing with it now to try to recover some thank of that, that history. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I think we have time for questions. Um, I know that there are a couple in the chat already, so I'll start there. And you can also raise your hand uh, if you have a question. So the first one from Aji, Aji, A-A-G-E-E. -E. Uh, I don't oh, know if you're um, still here. Um, this was done early on. I'm not sure what it means. So if if he is if this person is no longer here, then maybe we should go to the next so, one. Um, yeah, actually, I might have meant I actually didn't write down in my presenter notes. But I just remembered that it was an astronomical thing, and so it might well have been a comet. And if the text says comet, it was a comet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, and then uh, Sharon uh, Newman has a question. I apologize for going off topic. Does anyone have? contact information on Ara Distorian who translated Matthew. I don't, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, <laughs> Nick has a question. Great. Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Tara, for this, for this fascinating talk. Um, this is a question that kind of comes out of um, more or less total ignorance, um, but I was really, you know, struck by the late date of this copying tradition. And actually, I guess I kind of have two questions. The, the first one is, how does this all relate to printing and um, the kind of attempts to print in Armenian? Is that, uh, you know, the, how does that work with these sort of groups um, that are so spread out uh, in, in mm -hmm. you know, across Europe and, 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 and Eurasia? And um, I guess the other question is more uh, one, it's kind of a more open-ended question, but um, about sort of how, how we define the kind of chronological borders of manuscript traditions, because this is a question we often wrestle with 
at the Schoenberg Institute, um, you know, when, when do manuscript cultures continue uh, or, or end at, at, across and in different places in different regions? Um, you know, we try to sort of set limits. We we have a journal, you know, and so there's this question of, well, is an article about, you know, 18th century transatlantic letters about manuscripts? And so we sort of argue that, no, mm -hmm. you know, manuscript cultures are scribal cultures. But, you know, you showed some examples, interesting examples from the, you know, early 19th century. So the, I guess the, 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 the second question is more about sort of what, how does this work um, give us a new perspective on kind of the chronological and also sort of geographical boundaries of, of manuscript cultures? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And I, I don't have the, the perfect knowledge that I would need to completely answer it because I tend to keep my nose pretty firmly in the 11th century and only venture into the 17th when I'm, when I'm trying to, to milk the text from these manuscripts. But I can say that it's interesting because printing in Armenian, in the Armenian language actually started not, you know, relatively early. So I think sometime in the 17th century, there was already the Armenian printing press in Amsterdam, for example. Uh, and the uh, I mentioned these two these two late historians Tovma Metzopetsi in the middle of the 15th century and Arakal of Tabriz in the 17th century. So exactly at the time that all of these manuscripts were being copied, Arakel's text was being printed. So they all I can say is that they really seem to have existed in parallel. And the the scribal culture, the the you know the practice of actually hand copying these these ancient and classical texts seem to have gone all the way through into the mid 19th century because a lot of the a lot of the manuscripts that you find in Armenian collections are from for example the 19th century and they're not letters they're actually copies of older texts or copies of the bible or or these things so so you know it is interesting because at least in the Armenian culture manuscript and print did coexist for at least a couple of centuries and i don't know of any uh, the where my ignorance really shows itself is that I wouldn't be able to tell you whether there's a geographical pattern to this or not. Thank you again very much. Um, this is this is a, a part of manuscript culture that we, um, you know, certainly at the Schoenberg Institute uh, can certainly uh, learn more about. And we hope to we look forward to hearing more about the project and how it evolves. Thank you. Yes, I thank you very again, again very much for the chance to you know talk about all these wonderful little manuscript mysteries that I don't usually spend much time thinking about because I'm too busy doing text collation and text edition and text comparison and text 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 and less of the actual you know pen and paper and ink and, and all of that stuff. So it's been it's been fun to come back to think about again and and it's been really making me think about um, think about the sheer sophistication that was clearly there in terms of how these manuscripts were copied and how they were planned and the, the works of scholarship that all these copies basically were. It's, it's really quite intriguing. And um, given that I've just been teaching a, a stematology seminar this semester, starting with Paul Mass, it kind of puts, uh, you know, it kind of puts this idea that scribes do error and, you know, error is what scribes do. It kind of throws that out the window. And I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, it is definitely. <laughs>